Okay, everyone, welcome to today's Cello Circle with Alicia Randizi Hooker. Alicia, welcome. Hi. Thanks, Andrea. So, Alicia, um, tell us a little bit about um, about you and where you are, and maybe a little bit about your teaching, um, your studio. Sure. Well, I live presently for the last 20 years in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, we moved here after my husband completed his medical training. Um, he was, we lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania prior to that by way of Louisiana, where we had a former life as um, both orchestral musicians. And after four years in a professional brass quintet based in Philly, my husband changed careers and went to medical school. So he was a musician? Yeah, he's a horn player. <laughs> I didn't know that, that's so cool. Yes. yes, for 10 years and principal horn of the Shreveport Symphony and then the hornist of the Chestnut Brass Company, um, which has a Grammy and um, they are based in Philadelphia and he was he played with them for four years, but life on the road and income like this <laughs> uh, got to be a bit much. So he decided to change careers and he was accepted to the post-baccalaureate pre-health program at the University of Pennsylvania. And he went to medical school after that. And in the midst of it, um, I had found Suzuki teaching and I was freelancing in Philly and um, got my master's at Temple University. Um, and then I started. Who did I you study up, with? Who did you study with at Temple? At Temple. Oh well, that's a saga. Okay. Oh, geez. <laughs> well, I can sit here all night and talk and talk about all of that. But I will say this: I went to Temple because I got a free ride. I went to Temple because I got, um, I got an assistantship and I got the piece of paper that I would have gotten at SMU with Lev Aronson had I been able to stay to do my master's. If Henry had not won this audition, I would have been in Dallas. Um, but that didn't work out. And I had already studied with Lev for two years. So um, when we moved to Philly, I just wanted to finish my master's degree. Temple gave me an assistantship and away I went but I didn't do the politically correct thing. So um, I, at that point, they were sort of between cello teachers at Temple. Hirofumi Kano, who had been a student of Starker, was there, and, but he was leaving. And Temple had just merged with the new school and Orlando Cole was the cello teacher. And Lev Aronson said to me, whatever you do, stay away from Orlando Cole. I know this is not politically correct stuff, but this is what happened. So I went looking for a teacher and I studied with Deborah Reeder, who is the, was the principal cellist of the Pennsylvania Ballet and Opera and um, had studied with Luigi Silva. So, you know, it kind of her training, she left Curtis because of Mr. Cole. So we had this sort of coalition, I suppose. And of course, that really did not endear me to Mr. Cole at all. So I was a little bit between a rock and a hard place through my whole master's. Um, and also, I was kind of a recovering train wreck. I had all of Mr. Aronson's teaching and ideas, two years worth of study with him because I was trying to get out of Shreveport and win an audition somewhere. And in the meantime, my husband won an audition. <laughs> and I thought, well, Philadelphia, how bad can it be, you know? So off we went. And I think a lot of what, my, what has informed my teaching was my study earlier study um, with a Leonard Rose student as an undergrad. And then, um, and then Lev, who really made a cellist out of me. But it took another two years of just 
working up here and we're working with Debbie and and then and that was Debbie who Debbie Reader, Reader R E E D E R and then you know I mean I took lessons with everybody I could who would sit still long enough kind of you know when Avi was talking about I I studied for a summer with Hans Jensen um I studied with Laszlo Varga at a music festival. I, I took lessons with whomever and whoever I could, trying to find this, you know, this missing whatever it was and, and get over my incredibly crippling performance anxiety, oh. um, which I've had all my life, you know, until like the last, 20 years, <laughs> which is amazing. But I mean, most of my or most of my teen years and my early professional life, I'd go to auditions, I'd be really prepared and then crash and burn because of nerves. And that's a whole other talk, isn't it? That, that you could yeah. probably shed a lot of light on. Well, that. I think the stuff that I'm, it interests me tonight and that we are talking about tonight, um, largely grew out of ways to manage oh. performance anxiety. And also because, you know, I, I, the, the thing that happened with my assistantship at, at Temple was they wanted me to teach in their Center for Gifted Young Musicians and in their community music program, mm -hmm. which was for, you know, inner city kids. Um, largely poor. I, I did that every Saturday for the two whole academic years. I really learned a lot. And then they started this, they, they said, well, we want you to get Suzuki training. So off I went to Ithaca, to the Institute there. And that's where I met the person who mentored me for the next 10 years. And that's Annette Costanzi and also Carrie Beth Hockett. And those were my life changers. I think I also met Alice there <laughs> <laughs> once upon a time. So, you know, but, but really my long-term training with Annette is what changed. It made everything that I had learned that was living up here sink down into my body. And that approach, especially with little tiny people, is what informs my teaching today and, and which I continue to be fascinated by the process. So presently now, after Henry finished med school and we were in Philly for 14 years and I, I had a lot of success as a teacher, I was really um, on fire but you know you have to earn a living and we graduated medical school with a huge debt load and had to go somewhere where we could pay off the loans mm -hmm. so we were in texas for three years and i had a lovely little studio there we're in texas um, um wichita falls oh, nice. it's like, uh, north central texas it was like a two and a half hour drive to dallas and I taught in Dallas. I had a class of 10 students in Dallas. Um, it, that was great, but it was exhausting because, you know, five hours in the car and then coming home and having to, you know, be a mommy. Uh, that was hard. So after three years of that, and Wichita Falls was a very small city, and, you know, I was just, it, it was just not where I wanted to be. So um, Knoxville is my husband's home city. And um, Carrie Cheney and Elliot Cheney had just left here, <laughs> leaving a big oh. hole. They went to Salt Lake City and Knoxville didn't have a Suzuki teacher. So it just seemed like a good place to come and be. And I played with the Knoxville Symphony and I met Wesley Baldwin and you know we just sort of it, it's been a good place it's been a really good place not as glamorous and certainly not as high profile but 
but some of the best Balboa dancers in the country. <laughs> oh, I'm humbled. Yeah. <laughs> Well, tell me about, you know, I'm coming from this with, with little to no knowledge. So what is somatic? Oh, look, whatever. I don't even know what to call it. Okay. So all it is, I mean, what you are as a Suzuki teacher is a somatic teacher. It is, it is in the DNA of the Suzuki method. You know, all it means, it's just a word that means pertaining to the body. But here's what I found over the years of teaching is that sometimes that connection gets interrupted. And it's certainly, you know, I mean, when you start playing the cello and it's completely interrupted as it was in me, I didn't, I had my first lesson at 13, actually two weeks before my 13th birthday. So I was a late beginner and I, all I wanted was to play this thing. So, you know, I was like this and, and basically didn't have it. I had a teacher who made me love the cello and fall in love with the music, but didn't understand how to teach technique. So my entire undergraduate years were about learning how to manage this instrument physically and make a, 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 a sort of a controlled noise, you know, <laughs> but I managed somehow to make a sound, but then it would go out the window with nerves. And it was really in, in graduate school where I had to take all of the things that I'd learned from Mr. Aronson and process them and then beginning Suzuki teaching. And I'll never forget that first class, that very, very first, the keynote that Alice Joy Lewis gave, you know, all children, all Japanese children speak Japanese. It was like, you know, well, duh, but you understand it here. But what that means when you see a tiny five-year-old girl go through a whole week struck with a hyper stress sort of like overbearing mother and this child was so like checked out and at the end on the fourth day on thursday to have this child play french folk song and make me cry i thought okay this is it this is where i belong this this is the real deal now all little children are at home in their bodies. So if, if we don't mess them up, that's the big thing, right? If we can stay out of their way. Yeah. If we can get out of the way. So, you know, the, the influences in, in thinking about how to approach little people and what to do and, you know, the idea of, I, I don't um, remember the exact circumstance, but I remember going to a Suzuki workshop or something and someone was giving a talk called setting up the left hand. <laughs> and I sat there going, no, 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 no. There's got to be like, it, it's not just the hand. It's everything. It's everything. So how do you put a cello there and have it feel like it's just growing out of their body? You know, how do you put a bow in someone's hand? And Irene said this, like the bow starts here. That and that said that too. The bow starts here and it ends here. How do we get that? It's about somatic means how does that feel and how do we get it to feel as if the 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 joining of the hand and the bow is just like you don't think about the seam in your shirt sleeve right right it's just there it's holding the garment together so that's the way i want the bow to feel in the hand 
and and well, how that's so i'm uh, sorry to interrupt you but that's so fascinating you know all of these things end up coming together what we're trying to do is teach kids to play very naturally right and exactly. what i've been into during this stupid virus is a linguistic approach um, and really getting into current linguistic research and the current linguistic research is stop teaching them grammar stop teaching them vocab surround them and what i've come to then is what we need to do is it's two different things. Teaching the music is one thing and teaching the cellist to use their cello, like their voice, like their mouth, like their tongue in the natural way that we are born out of the womb, being able to speak. Exactly. Obviously that doesn't happen. We're not born out of the womb, learning how to play the cello without pain. So that's so that's, I, I think that that's like a couple, this is the missing link for me is how to really get that done quickly and early so that we can get to the teaching of the music without thinking about the physical nature of process of the process of teaching or playing. Yes, I understand what you're saying. However, I don't think you can, I think the two have to be wedded together. Well, yeah, right. And I think that, that the music won't happen at all. Um, I won't say without the technique because that's that's sort of like a traditional mindset. What I will say is the music is already there. So what we have to do well, by there, what do you mean? It's already there. They already in have, their in their bodies. It's in their bodies. It's in, in our DNA. All people okay. are musical. Yeah. All beings, we are vibration. We are made of vibration, really. So having, setting up a bow hold is, is only, um, it's only successful if you can get them to experience the vibration and the sound Oh gosh, how do I find words for this? It's like, you know, when you've got, when they've got it balanced, you know, when it's in the sitting in the fingers. And I think Irene talked about this, like I lay the bow in the fingers and yes, we make bunny rabbits and we do all the cute little games that, you know, I think are really helpful to try and foster coordination. But it happens when it happens. It's like you can't hurry it. Mm -hmm. So so once it happens and they turn it over and you put it on the string for the first time, I mean, all this time they're plucking and playing the ant song and all of that sort of thing. And you're singing. And I try to get everybody to sing because that's where the music is. Right. You know, right? we vocalize, we hear, you're, you're audiating, you're teaching audiation, you're, you're pitch matching, you're singing D, you're singing the scale. It's, it's stuff that you covered actually in your cello bellow talk. And um, so you're, you know, you're already creating what you call, it, speaking about linguistics, when you're talking about vocabulary, you're creating a rich environment. And if the parents, even sort of get it, they have some kind of musical environment happening at home. And now I find with my older beginners and, you know, sometimes the listening and all of that falls apart because of academics and, you know, they, or the stuff that they're listening to, you know, is not going to really help them. So, you know, hopefully you have a parent that is actively engaged in creating this rich environment. And it is a bit like reading aloud. Singing is like reading aloud. Um, showing, having, having flashcards on the, I scatter them around the floor, music notation, just so that they see what, and I'll pick a card up and go, oh, look, this is taka taka stop stop. You look at this, that's what it looks like and throw the card back down, you know? So it's like, 
it's in the walls, so to speak. I hope I'm being clear. I hope, but it's very once, clear. Yeah. Yeah. Once you have this, it's cling again here, you know, we do basketball dribbles with no thumb. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> oh, attached to your fingers, you know, and then, okay, let's bring the thumb to the frog and the thumb is, I, I don't say the shelf, but I understand what Avi meant when he was talking about that. You know, you just bring the thumb to that place. And then if they have trouble with that, which I've always had trouble because I have really skinny thumbs. So I use a pencil gripper on my bow, like a surgical tubing or whatever. Keeps my thumb from slipping. Helps me a lot. And it helps a lot of my students. And... And then, you know, then it's just drop the weight. And of course, you're doing monkey arm swings, those, um, you know, cello handshakes, and, and taking their arm around in a circle. But even before that, I start standing. So can you feel the floor through the soles of your shoes? Can you keep your knees soft? Can you pretend you're skiing? You know, and feeling this transfer of weight in the feet and the spine and, you know, making sure they can stand. And then, you know, that then the, the numbers game that's in the Charlene Wilson book about you know, stand, cello, bowing feet, cello feet and sit and the swinging into the chair learning how to control the movement this way. You know, I don't just start with the chair and the cello because that they, they haven't experienced their bodies yet. I do some brain gym stuff, like touch your toes, but opposite this way, crossing the midline. Um, we, we fling, we do um, this book that I have is really helpful. It's yoga for children. So sometimes we're down on the floor, you know, and and they're doing twist seated twists. Again, it's mid crossing the midline. It helps activate the brain, right? right? So the language of the body that they feel and they sort of just by dint of doing these things, and we do um, these arm swings, like reach up overhead, and you're a tree, and you're reaching for the ceiling, and then we do arm swings this way and this way, and it activates the muscles of the back. Um, and all of this is before they even get the cello. So... And you feel like this approach then, um, it, how does it differ from what you or other people were doing previously before you considered being a part of this somatic approach? I think, well, uh, the, so, this approach is somatic and it, it was in my Suzuki training and also See. in my, also in. I think we just lost Alicia. <laughs> She's got sick of it and left. We start. Anyway. Well, we're, we're glad to have you back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. That was. <laughs> All right. Now that I've lost my train of thought, um, what you were saying, somatic approach and Suzuki. Well, you know, I was, I feel like I was really very lucky to do the training that I did with the person I did. Um, and so what, what happened is I, I, I start, I, I mean, I took a lot of her ideas and things that she was always doing arm swings and calisthenics and things like this. And I found that when I skipped that, that my students were, not connected right absolutely you know so i i i had to always revisit and try to expand on 
what I'd learned and I did uh, a workshop brain gym workshop um, I've done a lot of Alexander training lessons not I've never taken the training but right I've had like three years of lessons weekly so um, and many conversations and many books lots of reading um, so how that's played out over the course of many years you know and and I, I think um, I, I didn't ever study with Irene Sharp but I know where where her thinking comes from Margaret Roll and Lev Aronson who happened to be very good friends and served all over the country on like every cello competition jury and you know all over the world so I, I think what I do is really just pulling from from all of that and and trying seeing my role as a teacher as just more of a facilitator and you know not getting in the way and and I remember um, one a talk that Ed Sprunger did and this really stuck with me you know like everything he says sticks with me but one time he did um, a talk and one of the bullet points was don't just do something stand there <laughs> I loved that yeah yes get out of the way you know their playing is not about me or being identified them being identified as my student although ironically it turns out that that did happen but um what do you mean by that oh what i mean by that is just like i had a couple of students do really well in competitions and stuff like that and people would walk up to them and go so do you study with alicia randy c hooker <laughs> Because apparently they all look really natural and, you know, that's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. It's a validation, you know, that right. it tells you you're on the right track. But um, I, I think that pulling from, there are just over the course of many years of teaching, there are just certain things that stick with me. Um, breathing breathing with phrases um learning how to release tension because it's in inevitable using tension using nerves um but but with very very small children there is something that happens when you when you do these sorts of body activities that are away from the cello, but that teach them the choreography of the cello and the body. So the, yeah, I'm just thinking there's, um, you know, again, I'm coming from this linguistic approach. So yeah. Yeah. The, the latest linguistic theory, uh, probably not latest, but it's been around for a while, no longer are, are ling linguists who, well, people who aid um, people in, in learning a second language. So second language acquisition is directed more towards, um, like I said, not grammar and not vocabulary, but um, there's this guy, James Asher, who does total physical response. And it's, it kind of connects it all for me because what they do is instead of learning, this is the verb to sit and this is the verb to stand and sit means you are seated, you know, or however you want to define and stand means you stand. Instead, they take a whole class of people learning a language and, and they say, everybody stand up and everybody stands up and they say, everybody sit down and then everybody sits down. And these people don't know which word means sit and stand for a while. And they said, okay, you know, Jerry, you stand or Ahmed, you stand, or, you know, Sally, you sit. And so it becomes a physical connection with the words as opposed to a brain connection with the words and you know it's basically ex exactly what you're saying is yeah. that when we're doing this we want to 
give them the vocab, the physical vocabulary. You know, it's the motor skills, right? But connecting the motor skills and like, like you were saying, you can't subtract the motor from the musicality side. Exactly. And it's giving motor function, like naming, like coupling it with musical function in, in some ways, but also addressing it singly by in, in a fashion as well, much like these, the vocabulary is going to be connected with a motor motion. That's a very, very strong and good analogy. It's interesting. Because it's experiential. Right. That if you, if you take the motions, the gestures, I mean, I never heard the term gesture, musical gesture, really, until I was in college, almost about to graduate. And, you know, I thought gesture was when you fling your body around being expressive, right? <laughs> it's, you see so much the head banging cellist variety that where there's really nothing. I mean, I think of the, oh, God bless them, the two cellos, you know, there's like all of this emoting. And if you close your eyes and everything sounds kind of the same, that's not really what we we want, right? <laughs> Depends so, on who you're talking to. <laughs> I guess it depends on who you're talking to. They'll always have more money than me. That's, <laughs> you know, I guess maybe that is what you want, but um, but it's not my aim. My aim is is to have children connect to the sound, and ha and then that's the hook. You know, that's the intrinsic motivation that that we're really after i think and and it's also what i found when i went to you know i living for a long time on the east coast and i know alice can probably regale us with sto similar stories as well that when you live in the northeast corridor and there's music everywhere and you hear really amazing technically amazing cellists everywhere right but how i can count when what i was thirsty for was somebody to move me i want that visceral connection to the music that you know and and i had to learn how to get for myself as a player i had to learn how to drop my own defenses and deal with my body and the nerves and the um, the very very physical response to all of that, and also to try when I'm teaching to never even the the slightest whiff of it in in a student to to try and eliminate it right, you, right away. Could you go more into the nerves and your ex and your experience with this and how how you've come? Sounds like you've overcome your your. I'm sure it's not a hundred percent for anybody, but um, maybe get, go into that a bit. Oh gosh, sure. Um, if it's interesting, I don't I think know. It sounds like it's connected well, to it's what you're saying. Certainly, it's connected for me. You know, because it's informed my entire approach to teaching is to prevent not that you never get nervous, but not, but that it doesn't cripple. Right. Um, so when you're so scared and all you can think about is how am I doing, then it's really hard to think about what am I doing? <laughs> right. And, and I had to un, untie a lot of knots and go deep into my body like your friend feel where the emotion is coming from yeah go, go can you explain that a little bit i i mean i think i understand what you're saying but i want to make sure that i really do okay well at the risk of this starting to sound like you know you're my psychologist <laughs> This uh, happened to me all the time. There was a lot of therapy too welcome, involved. Welcome to my life. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my life. Exactly. I think I spent a lot of years tied in knots just because of um, family of origin issues. Oh. You know, 
so and I had to I was sort of like the shining light that was carrying the torch for the entire family so well that's a yeah that's heavy that gets pretty that heavy kind of puts pretty quickly that kind of puts a burden on a person mm. and um and I think it's one of the reasons why I have been drawn to um this approach to problem solving and also um healing and spirituality um I have been a seeker for a long time. And um, so that informs my teaching because I have, um, when you grow up in a really narcissistic family system, you learn how, I mean, if you can survive it and come out the other end, you have intuitive gifts <laughs> that just start firing on all eight all the time. So yeah. you, you learn how to read the energy in a room really quickly. And part of the performance anxiety was also picking up on the energy in the room. That, what a burden. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. I never big, even thought about lot, it that way. Well, yeah, it was a lot to unpack. And it's pretty personal stuff. So, you know, I don't know how much more I want to get into it, but right. I will say that I spent a lot of time learning how to unpack that right. and learning how to access the origin of my, and where it was at any given moment. That's, Not, what, that's what my friend said too. He said he could feel his feelings here or here. Or, and I, that's a thing. I mean, like to me, it's like it's, it's really woo woo. Yes, I know, but it, <laughs> no, but it it's a real thing. It's a real thing for a lot so for a lot of people. If you um, without going into super specifics about which emotions, but let's say you are experiencing an emotion, do you just go within? Feel, okay, I don't even know how to ask the question. Do you feel the emotion or search for the emotion and try to locate where you feel like it's originating in your body? Is that it? You can't. Well, this is where it gets really tricky because when you've been um, emotionally abused, you don't know. And it's, you, it's, like you're so up in your head yeah. that that you pretty much are like operating from the neck up you know so allowing your brain to stop and a oh, lot so of maybe for those of us who haven't felt that emotional abuse basically yeah and i haven't had to do the self-protective mechanism so maybe right. i have that connection and then for some people you have to explore that just to let down your defenses is that am exactly. i hearing you right yes That's yes interesting yes and in order to be a performer an effective musician right you have to be willing you have to open right Oh. So for me, learning how to open was all through yoga, Alexander work, breath work, rebirthing, <laughs> um, Feldenkrais, so that I could get out of my head and into my body. And, and then let and then the scary part was letting the feelings that were just piled up and and packed in pretty hard probably packed in pretty hard and letting myself feel them and realizing i wasn't going to die and you felt like they had locations oh yeah oh yeah That's amazing I'm yeah, sure, but, like I'm saying this as if I don't have this discovery process ahead of me. I'm sure I have plenty. I'm going to go after this and no, but explore. I mean, but the whole, you know, the, I think part of the reason I was drawn to Suzuki teaching and to this and to music 
um, of course, music being like the wordless expression of the inexpressible, right? So how to actually be able to do it, to be able to show in the music all of the gamut of human experience, right? Bach and Beethoven and everything, the riches that we have, not to mention improvisation and you know, all of the cool things that people are doing now. But, you know, in order to be able to sort of be grounded when you've never been grounded, to learn, and, and um, it, it's, it was a journey. So my goal in, in teaching was, first of all, to maybe have a bit of an influence in a family, to be the present adult the outsider who's who loves you know you know like your mom no matter what but in a different way to love children to do this nurtured by love thing and really really take it at, that's that's what it is right it's right. to be a significant witness to another human being's development and to help them give voice to and feel the freedom to be a, and give them the tools to then be able to be who they are right. in the world. So how to do, how I, how I do that or why I wanted to do it was because I didn't think anyone should have to go through what I went through. Yeah. And because I really do believe that every soul on planet earth is here for a reason and because if we're allowed to give our gifts of our authentic selves then the world gets to be a better place absolutely you know so this is where it all comes that's the that's the that's the reason that you know so but, I feel like, you know, with people like you who feel very passionately about something, it changes yeah. your worldview, right? So I wonder what, when you go about your life and your world and you see people, and when you think about this experience that you've had with this reconnection to your body, mm -hmm. what, when you look, look at people, what do you wish that they knew that you feel like you have a connection to these days? Oh, that's a really. Because you good... must see that at the grocery store, right? You must see yeah. it everywhere. Yeah. So, could you put that into words somehow? Like what you feel like is <sighs> missing, and what someone could possibly like there, if they only knew. <laughs> oh, if they only knew that they're beautiful. If they only knew that, that if they could only trust their heart if they only knew that kindness and generosity are that they that they do you don't have to um try to impress anyone with what you do or what you have but if you can just simply be you know i think are we human beings? Beings. And uh, that's what I wish people knew. Like, you know, it's, this is all about love, man. This is like, it's all about your heart and teaching the cello. What, what better instrument to, to try and express this inexpressible love that we all have inside of ourselves if we can just allow it mm -hmm. so in in teaching the instrument the mechanics of the instrument sitting on the floor with a five-year-old you know making bunnies and having them talk and 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 asking them you know from the minute they put the bow on the string how does that sound to you how does that feel? How does that feel? 
where do you feel that? And the other day, my the seven year old that I was telling you about before we started, I played, I just got my cello back after 18 months in the shop. It's basically a new cello. What did you get done to your cello? Sorry to sidetrack, but what? Two, two pregnancies here, you know, but I put the bow on the string. I played, I don't remember, a C on the G string because he was going to do Handel's chorus. And It. It's not really cooperating at the moment, but he said his eyes just went like this, and he said, "I could feel that in my shoes." Oh. And I mean, that was it. That that's just a that's what I want. I want to put the bow on the string, play a note for them, and have them feel it in their knees or feel it in their shoes. And he and I said, "Oh, Benjamin, that's magical." And his eyes lit up, and he goes, "Yeah." And I said, <laughs> "I bet you can do that." <laughs> you know. And then he did. That's awesome. So, it's 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 wanting all of what I do, really all of what I teach, all of what I try to communicate is, can you feel it? How does it feel in your, you know, can you feel your fingers on the bow? Cause you know, we were talking the bicycle spinners and, and I thought that is great. I love that. I'm going to use that, but I then want them to feel, I want them to feel that. I want them to feel it when they're little. I want them to feel it from day one because you know when you when you feel that connection to the instrument and the resonance and the the power of that. That that's it. That that's the, that's intrinsic motivation. That is what hooks the child. That's what keeps them going. That's where the connection. And then you know I then when they say oh, i can feel it in my chest or you put the bow on the c string and they have to play their first you know when they finally get to the c string and they and they notice that they can feel it in the bones of their arm right that's pretty cool yeah so that's what i mean by somatic awesome that it is when you allow, when you can keep them unblocked and undefensive and right. innocent, right? Without de defenseless, when we are defenseless, that's when we're really alive. And connected. And connected. And that's when the music happens. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Yes, there's technical control and there's mastery and there's learning the notes and understanding rhythms and key signatures and harmony and all of that stuff, which, you know, I mean, essentially, I loved um, your talk, by the way, because your cello bella talk, because that that's how I teach theory, too, you know, and I get all excited about keys and colors and, you know, I have I think I have a touch of um, synesthesia, you know, <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> but, you know, so when kids say, I'll say, what color is A major? And they'll go, yellow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's yellow for me too. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 then it's like on another level, you know, it's, it adds another dimension and it becomes, and then the learning becomes more about process than product. And, you know, we, we, this is, and that's a big conversation I have to have with parents too. Oh, that's, I was just having that conversation with my husband. It's like, how do I convince the students that their version of what happens next is important? 
their their opinions matter. It's not they don't have to have a tight teacher telling them what to do next. That that process is discovery yes. and is ownership. Yes, I see the absence of that with a whole boatload of students who've been going to school and been told what to do and how to sit in their chair and behave and listen to directions and not speak up even though they have an upset yeah. stomach and have to go to the bathroom. They should just sit there. It's like, ah, so frustrating. Can't drink any, can't take can't water, drink water bottles. I know. We, we know from brain gym and other teaching modalities that hydration is like the key to life. I know that, yeah, and again, that they, that what they have to say, or, you know, I'll ask a question, I teach a lot by sort of Socratic method, how does that feel, how does it sound, what did you like about your sound there, do you think that phrase has, and they look at me and they go, I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the conversation I had with Kara, um, earlier in this series about yeah, this child-led child -led things and yeah I think it's very similar that when you're following the child you can follow what their physical response is telling you you can yes. look at what they're giving you yes and run with it yes knowing or, what you know about the whole process that's right or you redirect it you know, if they're sitting there playing and they're like this and you can say okay put your cello down and stand up and they look at you like she's out of her mind and this is like a 13 year old boy and he's like what do you mean I'll put your cello down and stand up okay <laughs> okay now now imagine you have this string you know and you and now shrug your shoulders up around your ears and now drop them so which one feels better uh <laughs> i don't know <laughs> so i guess now i feel better i'm like yeah, okay exactly. so yeah pick your cello up and and remember that this is where your shoulders that's where they want to be right right i don't know if it's re i don't know if that relates but but there's so much now and especially i've noticed it with the online learning they're looking at screens for seven hours a day Right here. I don't know what it, you know, if your kids in Ann Arbor and are doing the same, but so seven nice. hours of, of school online. And then they have three hours of homework. Right. Some online. of which, a lot of which is online. Yeah, exactly. So again, we're, we're now living in a, in a, situation i'm not going to say a culture or an environment because it's not yet <laughs> but right now it is neck up disconnection fingers are typing eyes are busy so trying to get a, again this visceral physical connection to the cello to the music how did that how did that make you feel? And I know I have a couple of kids that are on the autism spectrum too. And one boy who I adore teaching and he's very much, you know, high functioning autism. But if I say, what does this, you know, do you, um, can you sense that this music has joy and happiness in it? And he'll kind of look quizzically at me and say, I don't really know, but, but I think if I had, you know, and he'll search in his mind for the words, yeah. the term, the right terminology. And when he finds one and it may take five minutes and I'll say, Joshua, can you connect to that feeling? And we were playing Dance Rustique. And I, and you know, I mean, I, I just sort of said, can you, I said, do you know what it means? And he said, well, is that a dance? And I said, yes. I said, so what's Rustique? I said, is it an, is it an English word? And he said, no. 
it's a romance language. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you know, it's French. And so I told him a little bit about um, the composer. And then I said, so it's rustic, it's a country dance. And I said, so can you imagine something? And he said, yeah, it's like the beginning is all the boys dancing. And I said, good. And I asked him to play it again. And it sounded like like a barn dance. It yeah. sounded like, you know, it had that energy. So, you know, it, somatic playing is so much connecting to an image, an emotion of, you know, I mean, we can all teach the teaching points of dance rustique. We know what the technical things are. Right. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. I think, yes, I want them in place. Absolutely. But I want to hear the boys dancing. That's what I want to hear. That's what I, that's what I want them to feel. I yeah. want them to feel it. And then, you know, breathe with the phrases and be engaged in the music. That's really, that's really beautiful. It's so nice to hear you speak about it like that, because I think, you know, I, I uh, think I approach it slightly from a different angle, but to the similar end, but it's nice yeah. to hear you talk about it, because I think you experience the music in a, in a different way, and, and experience the teaching, and engage the student in this very physical manner, in this very, sent with all the senses engaged and it's really refreshing to hear you talk about it like that. Thank you. I, I think, yeah, I want, I want my studio to be a multi-sensory mm -hmm. experience. Right. I want, and, and I want to hear that, um, environment, you know, it's like when you grow up in a house where there are no books, you can always tell the kids that have readers for parents and the ones who, you know, you go in their house and it's very sterile and perfect looking. And, um, but I love, I love the environments where there are just books piled up everywhere because you know that that's a rich linguistic environment. And I think that musically, the more you can, have children experience the sound and be surrounded in their teaching, in the teaching studio, in their home, by this rich musical environment, then, then it's sort of like your, your um, description of linguistic teaching these days, mm -hmm. that it's much more, it's, it sticks, it takes longer in some ways, right? but it's more organic mm -hmm. and then it stays. And, you know, I, I've always felt um, frustrated when I've gone to certain like master classes and things and you hear these wonderful cellists play and play and play and play. And they're all technically put together like they can do things I can only dream about, you know, <laughs> but I'd rather watch paint dry. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to try and convey to my students both the technical, the, the chops, so to speak and this connection to the music they're creating so that they feel like they're creating something. Yeah, right, oh, that's so great. And I, I wonder actually if um, Alice and Garth, if you wanna come on video and ask any questions or talk to Alicia at all, I mean, this part, you could also it's save crazy. that too. <laughs> <laughs> we could also save it until after the recording is off too, that's another option, but. Um, yeah. 
Alicia, it's just so nice to hear you talk about this. And I've been looking forward to, to it so much because, oh, because you, you know, I, I don't know so much about it. So it's nice to hear you hear you talk hear you talk it, about it. It's you know? just the word to describe an approach. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah, yeah. Alice or Garth, did you have any comments or questions for Alicia? I'm just struck by the, uh, you know, some of the things that we have in common uh, is a lot of what I've been doing as well for myself. And then hopefully in teaching is find what my body is capable of doing. Cause yeah. it was, cause in my case it was an injury that uh, messed everything up. Oh, and, wow. and so it's just, you know, even now I'm still, getting some of the basics down of just, can I get an arm relaxed? Can I get the, you know, I'm working through Alexander technique and physical therapy and that kind of stuff too, so. Yeah, I think Alexander is really, really good for helping you locate, you know, where there are energetic blocks or that things that come after you've been injured when you're rehabilitating an injury, that's, there's always that lurking, fear that you're going to aggravate it again or that it's not you know things are not quite well yet so mm -hmm. i think alexander is very very useful in that um i had i had a shoulder injury i just um i don't know like a bicep tendon that was i had tendonitis like right in here on my right mm -hmm. side so it it took a year you know of really being conscious but i was able to pretty much overcome it acts up every now and then you know <laughs> good for That's you great. is there anything else that alice or garth that you wanted to add um, I really enjoyed your talk. It's fascinating, interesting. Thanks, Alice. <laughs> yeah, and I was reminded of your talking about the linguistic thing, too. I remember hearing about an actress, I can't remember the details, that was studying for a, a part. I think she had to learn, you know, she'd been like left by herself in the woods and had to learn like this her own new language or something weird like that. But anyway, she rode a bicycle while she was learning the learning the words for her. And so again, it was like the idea of, I'm just assuming the idea that your body is involved in, you're not just sitting at a table trying to memorize, but your body is active and moving and that helps you engage yeah. with memorizing the words. I think we know this about children. I used to joke with my son's um, algebra teacher that if she could, if he could learn algebra while airborne on his skateboard, it probably he would learn it better. <laughs> but you know, I, oh, I I'll also pulled out another book that has been um, helpful. Uh, there, I think I showed you the Yoga for Children book. But do you know Eric Jensen? It's an educator. He wrote. Um, he has super, this book. He, yeah, I think. Well, show me the book. I think I have. I think you I have this one. Learning with the body in mind. No, I think I have a different one. Tell me about that. I'm gonna he look while I wrote, listen. He also wrote one called um, Learning uh, Music with the Brain in Mind. Yeah, this super. Is the one that I have. Yeah, yeah super. I teaching. have that too. That is a I don't, great. Book. I haven't read it yet, but what? Uh, it it's about? good. <laughs> Nancy Hare told me about this it. This is why I got it. This is yes, Nancy really Nancy. believed in this book. Yes, Nancy. I did uh, my practicum with Nancy, and she said, "I think you'd really like this book, Alicia." So I went home and I got it, and then I got this one, um, "Learning with the Body in Mind," because Alice he talks a lot. I mean, basically, what you just mentioned, this physical a motoric activity that wakes the brain up so that kids are um, able to retain information. Like sometimes if you, you know, you can tell in a lesson when they're zoning out and if you just get, make them get out of the chair and do something, 
like toe touches to the opposite toe or or stretching or anything like that it's like it, it flips a switch somehow so i think that there is a, a very strong relationship you know like that it will bring them sort of back to themselves it's a sort of like a you know the reset button was it somebody said has anyone tried unplugging the united states and plugging it back in again this is a meme that's been on facebook all week long <laughs> you know and so the reset of trying to interrupt interrupting in, in, in an alexander technique right the in, inhibition of the um response that of tension so if you do something that's not related to the cello just for like 30 seconds it it i think can reset the brain so that then they can suddenly do whatever it is that you are asking them to do the other thing i thought of that was kind of related is you know i've had a lot of physical therapy on my shoulder and um my last therapist wanted me to do these exercises, kind of a big motion with my right leg and then my le left leg before I did any of the, you know, the, the bands or anything, because apparently that gets everything working in your body, that bigger motion that you do with your hips and your legs yeah. and then on your shoulder. And it's, I mean, I don't know, I guess it's kind of related, but. Well, I think, you know, in, in I just I'm gonna think back to my very first unit of Suzuki training and what Annette said, which was train the big muscles first. So I think big muscles, when we can get the big muscles moving in the back or the legs. I mean, I really do think there's something to this standing up and and making them balance and just experience their feet. Right. Yeah, I like that the way you said that. Yeah, the roots of the tree, so to speak, or feel the feel the floor through the soles of your shoes. That, um, actually, I came up with that because sometimes even roots are too abstract an idea for some kids. But you know, to feel the floor is is that came from taking yoga. You know that mountain pose where you are rooted so you know anything that you can do to ground this student or make an awareness of the big muscles of the body the legs the shoulders the back then you know then it's easier to come down to bicycle spinning <laughs> and and you know because they will have experienced the larger their physicality and 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 once you feel the big muscles then the smaller ones are easier to um to to have access to i think you know i had one other comment hope i'm not talking too much not at all <laughs> what are you kidding after all my tirade <laughs> um so you were talking you know about children playing musically and relating to an analogy and when that happens in my lessons, and I, you know, I talk about maybe some analogy that helps them or the mood of the piece or something. And I, I say, well, we don't know how it works. We just don't know. But if you actually imagine, you know, that you're at a birthday party and you're really happy and then you play Allegro, something is going to change in your sound. Mm -hmm. Something's going to change and then kind of look at me and I say, yeah, we don't really understand that, but you know, and then they try it and I say, that sounded completely different, you know, and that's, that's the explanation as far as I can go is just that it works. Right, that it works, well, right? you know, if not to get to really woo woo on you here, but the idea of holding an intention. Right. You know, I mean, what is a prayer but an intention that we hold? What is a an emotion or the be, the ability to convey that or communicate something is simply by holding an intention in your mind because you know if you have that focus 
then it's much easier. It somehow it, it's like a signal from the brain or from to the body and then the body knows what to do. So no, I, I think that, you know, we, we just need to get more comfortable with, with that um, vocabulary and the language of emotions. And um, we want our students to feel a sense of safety too. So, you know, their, their initial, I don't know, or they don't want to really commit to a feeling or, or they don't want to appear foolish. But, you know, if the more we encourage it and try to create that safe, a safe space for them to have a voice, right? And, you know, and I'll even say sometimes you don't, I want you to think of a feeling, but you don't have to tell me what it is. I just want you to play it and something changes. So, you know, it's, it, it's really, um, it's interesting to, to actually finally be able to talk about this with other teachers. I love it. <laughs> have, have you not talked, talked about, about this with other people? Oh, I, have I? a few really trusted close colleagues yeah well now it's on the well, internet on the internet <laughs> that's right i'm in big trouble now <laughs> no it's really beautiful that you're willing to share this you know i don't it's not like like for me personally it's not like it's rocket no. science right it's, it's something that is there but actually for you it's a high hum presence and for me it's like a medium to low hum presence that i think if it's nice to think of it from your perspective because I think it just kind of brings it to the forefront. And of course, of course, that's so important and really powerful and so connected. And I, I really love hearing you talk about it. Well, thanks. I hope it, it, you know, I hope it's somewhat useful too and not just me getting all, we'll see get, in my next lesson. Getting all excited, <laughs> you know, about things that everybody just goes, well, yeah. <laughs> But what I love about these talks that I'm doing, you know, is I'm talking with all these people that I'm interested in. You know, all these, so many of my friends have so much to offer. Garth was a complete stranger, for example. So, and then it's like all of this goes in. You know, when I did my first teacher training, it was 1996 with Jean Dexter, and mm -hmm. I didn't do anything again till 2005. Yet I taught a lot of kids, and I really thought I had come up with so many things that were just brilliant, you know, so full of myself and so young. And then I gave a, I gave a workshop somewhere and um, I looked at my notes from Jean because I was like, you know, I should look at that. She might have had a, everything that I, I thought that they, I really thought they were my ideas. And I'm not so pig headed anymore, but what happens is we take in this information, just kind of goes in and it sits with us. And somehow your beautiful perspective on this approach to teaching is going to just come out in my teaching, whether I want it or not, because I've, because I've accepted it. You know, I really believe in what you're saying and, yeah. and it's, it's going to sit in me and then it's going to come out in some beautiful and unforeseen way, which I love. Right. Well, I so mean, that, that's what exactly happened to me, you know? That's what we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, right? Right, right? You can't help it if you're if you're hungry for the material and you're searching for something in your teaching and in yourself. You know, with me, it all started with me. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it. There was a time when I would be like, ah, so ashamed and feel so disempowered. I didn't think I had anything to contribute, you know, I thought I was just so un, unmade that I had to just pull it all. So I pulled in everything that I could because I needed to. But I, what I realize is now, you know, we, we teach what we, we teach, we wind up teaching what we ourselves have to learn. And essentially that's what tonight is about you know i'm telling you about me and my journey just because it's the thing that lit 
a teaching flame for me because I had to figure out, you know, if, first of all, is there anybody else in the world that needs this? And I have had some students that have needed exactly, were going through similar situations at home to what I went through. So help being able to be present and be a, a presence for them was helpful for them. And then there were the kids that were just little sponges and we connected on a level and, you know, lucky me that I've had a good number of really, really excellent students that are now in the business and doing really, really well. So that's nice. <laughs> it's nice because then you know that you're, you know, like I said, it, it feels like you're on the right track and that you've had an impact, a positive impact. But, you know, but beyond that, it's, um, ah, I, I think back now to something Rodney Farrar said to me once. Because he, he was he came and did an amazing workshop because he everything he does is amazing and you know Pied Piper of cello and such an incredible presence. And I said to him, you know, you're just the kids love you. You're magical. Thank you for your coming here and and being present to my students. And he said, well, you know, in the end, all we really have to give anybody is ourselves. And that's another, you know, it was another one of those moments that stuck with me that, you know, things, things that people say in passing that are just casual, that are just part of who they are, can't, you, you know, you can't help but be moved by them. So, you know, it's we we all we give that to each other and that's what's so wonderful about our suzuki community and also about the the cello community yeah absolutely and that cello bella workshop was so great because you could feel Wasn't that it? cello love abounding yeah. it was so yeah it's awesome. just sort of like it just goes with the instrument you know yeah and all the suzuki institutes all of that when cellos get together great things happen man Yep. Well, I think we should probably wrap it up here. Yeah. Alicia, you've been so generous to talk about this, and I just I really appreciate this so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for asking me, Andrea. I, I and, so enjoyed talking with you and all the opportunities that we've had, and you've been so generous with your time and tech help. Oh, my gosh. I don't think I could have done Zoom teaching without your little coaching me back in home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, I only pass it. I'm passing it forward. Garth, I took it from Garth. I gave some to you. It's, <laughs> it's all going around. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Garth, I'm going to um, look at your video. And it's so nice to meet you. And thank you so much. Yeah, for likewise. Time. And Alice, it's always so great to see you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I'll see you some other time, I suppose. I hope. Bye-bye. Right, thank you, Alicia. Bye. 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 <laughs>